Thank you, Tina. Check, check. OK, good. Good morning, fellow creatives and fellow naturalists. It's really wonderful to be here. And I'm actually a little bit um, amazed that I made it, because when Tina first reached out to invite me, I, I turned her down. I was like, you know, I just got back from two weeks in Europe, and actually not that long after I got home, I, I was stricken down with these horrible fevers, and I've been like lying in bed with 103 fever for the last few weeks. And also, Tina, I don't really think that three weeks is enough time for me to prepare a 20-minute talk. So could I do it next month? Or how about the month after that? Or, or maybe next year? <laughs> Creative morning speakers, they're just like us. Anxious, neurotic, procrastinating. <laughs> but Tina, in all her infinite wisdom, wrote me back and she was like, look, as someone who gets asked to speak, I can tell you, short lead times can be very helpful. And this was the kicker. The theme this month is wilderness. Here, we native English speakers say wilderness. But you could say wilderness if you want. Um, and she couldn't think of another topic that would be more suited to me that was coming down the pike anytime soon. So of course, I had to say yes. And just as an aside, um, since then, this, this earlier this week, I got a diagnosis of anaplasmosis, which is a tick-borne disease that causes relapsing fevers. So um, I don't know what my vibe is like. I feel a tiny bit shaky. I'm on doxycycline now, and that seems to be helping me improve. Um, but I know that you're going to get me through this, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're good. So of course, the minute I said yes, my mind went completely blank. I was like, wilderness? What, what does that even mean? And like one second before I Googled it, I had a brain flash. And I realized that I had just seen in this amazing little book I was reading by Terry Tempest Williams called When Women Were Birds. If you haven't read it, I, I highly recommend it to you. Anyway, she makes reference to the wilderness letter written by Wallace Stegner, an amazing Pulitzer Prize winning author and environmental writer. You probably know about him. And so I did go online at that point, And I was like, what is this wilderness letter? Let me find it, which I did. And it was there in its entirety. And I also found on YouTube a recording of Stegner himself reading it. So I was able to hear it in his own words. And I want to start today by reading you a brief excerpt from This is Wilderness Letter, written by Wallace Stegner, to the Outdoor Recreation Resources Review Commission in 1960. What I want to speak for is not so much the wilderness uses, valuable as those are, but the wilderness idea, which is a resource in itself. Something will have gone out of us as a people if we ever let the remaining wilderness be destroyed. If we permit the last virgin forests to be turned into comic books and plastic cigarette cases. If we drive the few remaining members of the wild species into zoos or to extinction. If we pollute the last clear air and dirty the last clean streams and push our paved roads through the last of the silence, so that never again will Americans be free in their own country from the noise, the exhausts, the stinks of human and automotive waste. And so that never again can we have the chance to see ourselves single, separate, vertical, and individual in the world, part of the environment of trees and rocks and soil, brother to the other animals, part of the natural world, and competent to belong in it. We simply need that wild country available to us, even if we never do more than drive to the edge and look in. For it can be a means of reassuring ourselves of our sanity as creatures, a part of the geography of hope. It being Stegner, of course, it's a beautifully written letter, no surprise there. 
But I find something painful in this idea that you know, we need to be standing at the edge of this pristine vastness in order to feel connected to the land and to ourselves as wild creatures. And it's also painful to think that these issues that sound so topical in this letter, they seem so relevant right now, they've really been part of the conversation for more than 60 years. Something about that coming to the edge of pristine vastness in order to feel connected, there's something in there that I would really like to dispel. I mean, do we really have to go so far from home to tap into that sense of awe and wonder and interconnectedness? Why do we? <laughs> Remember what it's like to travel? You get out in the world and, and all your senses open up and you're, you're seeing things closer and in greater detail and, and you're, you're smelling and you're hearing and you're looking and you're touching and you're feeling. It's like you're a sponge, like you're trying to commit all this stuff to memory. You're collecting all these impressions, right? But really, you're just kind of skimming the surface, you know? You don't live there. What would happen if you brought that same intensity of awareness, that same kind of curiosity to your everyday life. When you live where you live, you have an opportunity to go deep. If I get near this, is it going to be buzzy? I'll stay over here. <laughs> so it's all about going deep. That's what I want to talk to you about. During that first pandemic spring, all these people came up to me. They were like, wow! Have you heard all the birds? There's so many more birds this year. It's incredible. I, I, I'm just amazed at all the birds. Or, oh, I went out into my yard and, and I discovered all these new species of wildflowers growing there. Never seen them before. What is up with that? And I was like, guess what? This year is the same as every year. It's you that are different. Because what happened was people were slowing down, right? And they were staying in one place more and they were paying attention. So they were able to tune into these, these countless micro-seasons that we have, right? These incremental shifts that, that only are observable if you're in the same place paying attention. So what would it be like to really live where you live? What kind of relationship could you cultivate with the wilderness at your doorstep? And why would you want to? I mean, really, what's in it for you, right? Well, it turns out that when you get outside into places with plants and trees and water, it's really good dope. I heard that phrase, I read it rather, in the comment section on a New York Times article that I was reading. This article was about how scientists have determined the exact number of minutes per week that you need to be out in nature to maximize your health benefits. <laughs> yeah, they figured it out. Can you guess how many minutes that would be? Can I have some educated? Or? Tina read the article. 120 minutes a week. Two hours a week, that's all you need, you're good, right? And so I was like, let me go to the comment section because I'm interested. When something seems polarizing to me, I love reading those comments. <laughs> and sure enough, Matt from Tallahassee had weighed in. And he was saying to people, oh yeah, you can get out there and get your two hours, but watch out because you're going to want a whole lot more because nature is really good dope. <laughs> yeah. And there's powerful evidence that even just walking under the, for, uh, the canopy of a living forest is, is really good for your health, right? It lowers your blood pressure, it, it helps you with stress and anxiety, it makes you focus more intensely, um, all of these things. It even extends your life expectancy. You can be under some trees, you can live longer, yeah? Being out in nature helps you access your creativity. This is the crowd for that, yeah. It makes you more flexible in your thinking, more able to get in touch with new ideas. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? If you breathe in negatively ionized air, like what you inhale when you're near a waterfall, it does things to your brain waves that promote calm and clarity. Now that's addictive. 
but do we really need all this kind of science to confirm what we, what we know in our bones? Our bodies remember. Our bodies hold this knowledge. And why wouldn't they? Because for nearly 200,000 years, we lived close to the land as hunter-gatherers, in sync with the seasons and cycles, intimate with the plants and animals. Do you think that made an impression on us? It's written in our DNA, right? It's, it's really who we are. And I think it's also a large part of what, why foraging is so freaking popular to this day. I mean, I used to think it was an, ex, an expression of our extractive conditioning, this idea that you would arrive at the edge of the forest and treat it like, I don't know, a Wegmans, right? <laughs> what can I get? What can I get? What can I get? I didn't even want to call my walks foraging walks. I was like, let me just call them guided nature walks, even though we always talked about edible and medicinal plants. I just didn't re want to reinforce that sense that we're all out there for what we can get, right? But then I kind of put my empathy hat on. You know, I thought about it a little more, and I was like, you know, that hunter-gatherer thing, that instinct, that is strong, that is powerful. Of course it's still in, in us, right? It's in our lizard brain. We've all got that. And if I'm being 100% honest with you, that thing of arriving at the edge of the forest, hoping for some chanterelles, that's not exactly foreign to me. In fact, it might be actually how I got started on this whole journey. Yeah. My husband says that foraging taps into all of the things I love best. Delicious food, beautiful nature, a good workout, and a great bargain. <laughs> I'm a cook, so I wanted to find some morels or some hen of the woods or whatever, right? So what did I do? I got some field guides, and I started teaching myself. And what happened? My whole life changed for the better. And eight years later, I founded the Outside Institute because I just, I had to find a way to share with other people these incredibly healing and transformative experiences. There's just no way to overestimate pleasure as a reason for being outside. The sheer beauty of it, the gorgeous colors, the amazing fragrances, the sensuality of diving into water, of feeling the air on your skin, of crunching an aromatic, sweet, delicious cluster of black locust blossoms. I mean, you just can't beat it, what it does to you to be outside soaking all this stuff in. And I'm here to tell you today, this is your birthright. You were born to this. So with that in mind, it's probably maybe 50-50, that when you step outside, you'll feel at home, right? And what will reinforce that sense of belonging is the fact that nature is an entirely judgment-free zone. The wind doesn't care how much you weigh. Birds don't notice if you color your hair or not. No squirrel is ever gonna run up to you and be like, hey, where'd you get those boots? <laughs> It's not going to happen, right? You get to just show up exactly as you are and feel accepted. Or maybe you get outside and you don't feel so comfy, right? That's OK, too. I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of innate things that still need to be learned. Just because something's natural doesn't necessarily mean it feels natural. I take a lot of people out in the woods that are like, they're like, bugs, spiders, ticks, ah, what's happening? And, and I'm like, just chill and be willing to step outside your comfort zone just a little bit. 
And you know what happens? Sooner or later, that good dope kicks in, and you realize you're right where you're meant to be. Yeah. When you make these amazing experiences part of your daily life, your life changes. You're able to cultivate a kind of intimacy to get that sense of belonging. It's, it's life affirming. So you're probably like, OK, I, well, how do I start? You know. Luckily for us, the brilliant poet Mary Oliver left so many words of wisdom for those of us yearning to get back to our true nature, including these. To pay attention. This is our endless and proper work. Believe it or not, the wilderness is at your doorstep, even right here in New York City. All you have to do is open up, engage your senses, and be willing to draw it in. You'll be rewarded for it. So what do you do? You step outside, and you keep your phone in your pocket. That's essential. Despite those sirens and all that unwanted noise, if you have your earbuds in, you don't hear the birds or the sounds of the wind. You'll want to. If you can, walk in a park or some green space or near a body of water. But if you can't, that's fine. Wherever you go, I promise there will be plants and critters for you to enjoy. Look up at the sky. Study the cloud formations. Check out the vestiges of last night's moon. In the city, peregrine falcons roost on skyscrapers, right? Giant puffball mushrooms are cropping up in abandoned lots. On the West Side Highway, I've seen rose hips, burdock, wild carrot, even chicken of the woods mushrooms thriving. It's all out there. And as you walk, you'll notice yourself becoming hyper aware, but at the same time, kind of dreamy and semi conscious. Your monkey mind will quiet down if you just focus on this place in this moment. You'll see a bumblebee making its way into a flower. You'll notice some intricate designs underneath the bark of that tree. You'll see how the leaves are rustling in the wind. And from this place of genuine curiosity, questions will bubble up. You'll be like, what is that bee doing in that flower? Pollination. <laughs> Who made those incredible designs under that tree bark? The emerald ash borer beetle. What leaves are those shaking like that in the wind? Quaking aspen. Well, the answers can come from so many different places. Find someone like me, a naturalist, to take you out for a walk and glean knowledge that way. We're around. Ask the Google. Internet, incredible font of information. There's even apps like PlantNet and iNaturalist that will help you identify virtually any plant just from a simple photo that you take with your phone. Watch a YouTube video. Get some field guides. We've created three. However you like to learn, try a little of this, a little of that, the information is out there for you. So do we have time for a little show and tell? Yeah, OK, good. So I want to show you a few of the things that sparked my curiosity and provoked me to have deeper engagement with the world around me. I think you probably all recognize this as an antler, right? So um, this is from a white-tailed deer. And these are ubiquitous where I live in the Catskills. 
And um, in the dozen or so years that I've been living upstate now, I'd only found maybe three or four of them. And I was curious, we have so many deer, why wasn't I finding more antlers? So I did a little research, and I discovered that um, bucks, which are the male deers, grow new antlers every year for mating season, and then they shed them at the end of the year. So I was like, who knew? They shed their antlers every year? You'd think the forest floor would be littered with these things, right? Well, it turns out that they're an important food source for all kinds of animals. Chipmunks, squirrels, porcupine, basically anything with teeth, even other deer. They're eating these for the calcium and phosphorus and minerals that they contain. So the reason that you don't find them all the time is because they're a popular snack. <laughs> How about this? Anybody seen anything like this before? You know what this is? It's a plant phenomenon. I found this growing on a high bush blueberry, but I'd seen it in like slightly different iterations on a bunch of other plants and trees. Never knew what it was. I was like, that thing looks like a witch's broom. It's called witch's broom. <laughs> it's a stress reaction. So like an aphid or a virus or a bacteria or a fungus irritates the plant somehow. And the plant creates this profusion of growth in reaction to that. And people call it witch's broom. Now, this behemoth, shedding bits and bobs, um, does anyone recognize this? Chaga. You probably know that from your trendy local coffee shop, right? <laughs> Chaga latte, anybody? <laughs> yeah, well, if you haven't actually seen Chaga, it's this hard mycelial mass that extracts betulinic acid and other immune-boosting chemicals from the birch tree. And um, in a tiny little bit of synergy, I was peeking out wistfully at that garden through that window when I got here, and I saw there's a birch tree out there, and I think it has a little bit of incipient chaga growing on it. So chaga has amazing anti-cancer properties. It's a traditional medicine of the indigenous people of the Ural Mountains for thousands of years. I read that as far back as the 12th century, a Tsar in Russia was drinking tea made from chaga to cure his lip cancer. So these are the kinds of things that you come across when you keep your eyes open. I know what you're thinking. You're like, she lives in the Catskills. Of course she's going to come across that kind of stuff. But honestly, there's chaga right out there. And I once saw a giant detura bush which is jimson weed or loco weed, for those of you who may have heard of it. It's a powerfully hallucinogenic plant. It was growing right on an island in the middle of Third Avenue. Yeah. And about six weeks from now, a whole bunch of trees in the East Village are going to drop ripe mulberry fruits. So it's everywhere. Nature is so bountiful. But I ask you to remember, she is not a retail boutique. This is not so much about what you can take. Although, as you see, there's plenty to take, and it's there for us, right? You have to do it mindfully and sustainably, learn about the foraging rules and regulations. But it's really more about this incredible web of life that you belong to. Like all the best relationships, the one you have with nature, has to be reciprocal. The indigenous tribes have a wonderful tradition of leaving something on the land as tribute in gratitude. It's often just like a little sprinkling of tobacco. What will you do? Maybe you'll pick up some trash or some dog poo. God, this city is so gross. Maybe you'll start giving pigeons some respect. It could be as simple as that. Maybe you'll plant some milkweed on your fire escape to support the endangered monarch butterfly. Maybe you'll join me in moving dead animals off the road. I like to give them 
a more beautiful, more graceful final resting spot. I don't want you to worry about what you're going to do. What I want you to do is step outside with an open heart. And the answers will reveal themselves to you. I promise. May the forest be with you. <laughs>